Hey, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to invite you to a roundtable regarding Ukraine and international law. The title of this roundtable is Covandis. It's about the future or not of international law. And we're very excited here at the World Studies Department of King's College London that we have a, a line of experts and uh, very well-known uh, scholars to comment and, uh, and discuss their own taking about the recent developments we have during the last two and a half weeks regarding the Russian invasion in Ukraine. Uh, having said that, I, about a week ago, uh, the Professor Tuvena, while pleading uh, on behalf of Ukraine, he started saying that international law is not just an empty promise. And what is quite interesting is that we have seen during these last two weeks an overproliferation of references to international law and the hyperactivity of international lawyers. So here during the, this hour, uh, one and a half hour, we are going to comment uh, to try to assess what does that mean about the future of international law. Now, my name is Maria Varag. I'm a lecturer in international law at the World Studies Department. I'm very happy to have with me uh, Dr. Veronica Belkova from the Institute of International Relations at the Faculty of International Law in Prague. Um, Associate Professor Dr. Devika Hovel from the Law School, uh, from the London School of Economics Law Faculty. Uh, Professor Tim McCormack, who is joining us from Tasmania, that's why we start uh, so early, uh, who is also apart from a well-known IHL scholar, also um, advisor, special advisor on war crimes to the prosecutor of the ICC. Professor Yuval Sani from Hebrew University, an expert in public international law, human rights law, and IHL, and also former chair of the Human Rights Committee, and Professor Jan Klambers from the University of Helsinki Law Faculty, an expert on international organizations. Having said that, I'm not going to take uh, more time from our speakers, so I would like to give the floor to Dr. Veronika Bilkova, who is going to address first the prohibition of use of force. So before um, I ask Veronica and the other experts, what is their take? So Veronica, what do we get out of the prohibition of use of force during the last two weeks? Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for the invitation. Good morning to everyone. I just put my watch on. Really a pleasure to be part of this interesting event. I have been asked to address the question whether what we witness in Ukraine is actually the death or the revival of Article 2.4 of the UN Charter containing the prohibition of the use of force. And my answer is simple and probably not very surprising. It's neither one nor the other. It's clearly not the death of Article 2.4. While this provision has been violated by the Russian attack on Ukraine, this attack does not threaten the existence of the provision. Yet at the same time, what we witness it, it's, is not the revival of Article 2.4, at least if we understand the revival as meaning a return of something which for a long time was neglected or forgotten. And let me explain myself in more detail on these two issues. So first on the death of Article 2.4. Since 1945, this article has been diagnosed dead many times by many persons, by Thomas Frank in his famous article in 1970, by Jean Combaco in the late 1980s, by Frank again in, 19, in 2003, and by, by many other scholars with respect to Kosovo, Libya, Syria, uh, Iraq, etc. What all these different diagnoses share is that they rely on three main causes of the alleged death. And in my opinion, none of these causes materializes in the current situation in Ukraine. So the first cause of the alleged death of Article 2.4 is the disrespect of Article of this provision and a large acceptance of such disrespect. States would use force in clear violation of 2.4 that they would not deny doing so, and other states would either remain silent or they would condone such behavior. This is clearly not the situation in Ukraine today. True, there is a violation of Article 2.4 by Russia. Yet, this violation is denied by the responsible state, which tries to justify it within the UN framework, within the Charter framework. At the same time, 
this violation is strongly condemned by virtually anyone else in what is probably the strongest wave of criticism of a military action we have ever had since the Second World War. So the first cause of the alleged death of Article 24 is clearly not applicable. So what about the, the, second, death, the second cause? Here, Article 24 is allegedly called from within. States resort to an extensive interpretation of the, of the two exceptions to this provision that are foreseen in the Charter, self-defense and UN collective actions, or in addition, they invent additionally additional exceptions. And this creates so many loopholes that in the end, the prohibition of the use of force simply collapses. Is this what we witness today? I would say clearly not. First, Russia does not really invoke any new exception to Article 24. It seeks, sorry, just one quote. It seeks to squeeze its action within the self-defense uh, exception. Secondly, Russia, is the phone. Secondly, Russia partly relies on what actually would be a valid legal ground for the use of force if, however, the factual conditions were met. I'm speaking here about collective self-defense that could be perfectly lawful if, however, Russia were intervening in support of a state, not two de facto entities in the, in the eastern part of Ukraine, and if it were responding to a previous armed attack. So this justification fails, but it fails on factual grounds. And finally, thirdly, Russia also inv invokes, and that is the only new element, preventive self-defense. It argues that Ukraine might become a threat for it in future, especially due to its renewed nuclear ambitions. Now, we all probably remember that a similar claim was made by the US with respect to Iraq in 2003. But then this claim was rejected by the vast majority of states and also scholars, not only as factually wrong, but also as legally unsound because uh, preventive self-defense was found to be manifestly incompatible with Article 2.4. And we witnessed the same rejection on both factual and legal grounds in the Ukrainian conflict today. So that means that the second uh, cause of the potential death of Article 2.4 is not applicable either. Finally, we have the third alleged cause of this death. This time, the, the diagnosis is pre prescriptive rather than descriptive. It is not argued that 2-4 is dead, it's argued that it should be killed. And it should be killed because it constitutes the only obstacle to the use of force that would otherwise, rightly or wrongly, be seen as legitimate. It is the Kosovo type scenario, where one state allegedly violates fundamental or legal norms, and another state wants to intervene by military force to stop these violations, yet it can't rely on self-defense, and the UN system is paralyzed. Since such situations allegedly happen again and again, it's argued that Article 2.4 should be set aside altogether. And there is a whole debate going on about this argument, but we can happily leave it aside because it's not really relevant for the current situation. True, states refrain from using force in support of Ukraine, yet they do so not because they would face legal obstacles, in fact, the title of collective self-defense is easily available, but rather because they face factual obstacles, because Russia is a big power and it has nuclear weapons, put it very simply. So we can see that none of the three alleged causes of the death of Article 2 far is applicable in the current situation in relation to Ukraine. Does it mean that the provision has been revived? So do we witness the revival of 2 far? I would not say so either. A revival in my understanding presupposes that a provision starts to be applied in a context in which it was not applied for a long time. But what is the context here? One sovereign state carries out an open and large, large scale attack on another sovereign state without having any credible legal title to do so, and other states react by condemning this attack. Is this really something new that we did not witness for, for a long time? In my opinion, it is not. Russia's action has interfered with the very core of Article 2.4, the prohibition of aggressive war, 
which has never been, at least to my knowledge, seriously questioned. The attack has not, on the contrary, cast any light on what could be called the penumbra of the provision of Article 24, for instance, on the role of non-state actors in under this provision or the possibility of carrying out an armed attack through other than kinetic means, for instance, through cyber means. What we deal with in this situation is a very classical, I would say almost a World War II-like instance of the use of force, and it has never been put into doubt that such use of force remains prohibited. So to conclude, I would say that while Article 2.4 is crucial for understanding the conflict and the situation in Ukraine, this conflict on its turn does not tell us much about Article 2.4, and it does not help us to understand its extent and its content and its scope better. Thank you for your attention. I'm, I'm happy I've, I, I've managed to do so, uh, to uh, have the presentation within 10 minutes. Uh. Thank you very much, uh, Veronica, for your very timely intervention. And thank you very much also for uh, <coughs> your critical reading insight. This is very, very uh, useful. And I'm sure you know we will have many questions on this front. Now, I would like to give the floor to Devika Hovell. Uh, Devika, uh, I had read, I read very carefully uh, your original talk. Uh, before the General Assembly proceeded, you know, with the Uniting for Peace, um, based on the Uniting for Peace uh, resolution. And I'm looking forward, you know, to, to your understanding, to your reading of the events of the two weeks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for putting this together. There's something very uncomfortable, of course, talking about legal technicalities. Well, I know all of us are watching people fighting for their lives and livelihoods in Ukraine. So I just want to acknowledge that and... Um, that is, of course, at the forefront of our minds. Um, I think it was Vladimir Lenin that said there are weeks where decades happen. And that certainly feels like it's been the case. And much of it too feels like it's teetered on the existential. Um, so the Cold War has set in again, if it ever stopped. Uh, we've reached the end of the end of history and East and West are once again in the position of canceling each other out. And what Veronica had talked about sort of highlighted, you know, with the, again, the prediction of the death of Article 2.4 is this cancel culture that sets in uh, at times of global, global crisis. So implicated in this global existential crisis is, is also the fate of international law, the fate of Yusad Bellum, and also its facilitative institution, the United Nations. So perhaps predictably, not only is the death of Article 2.4 being predicted, but also the death of the United Nations. So just over this weekend, I've seen obituaries in the New York Times, um, while a recent article on the 10th of March in Foreign Affairs leads with the title, the UN is another casualty of Russia's war, why the organisation might never bounce back. And the article's author there, Richard Gowan, declares UN diplomacy to be in critical condition, arguing that it is exceedingly remote that Moscow and Washington will be able to use the UN as a channel for global problem solving in the future. Now, certainly the flaws of the UN collective security framework have been on stark display over the past fortnight. Many of you may have seen uh, on the 24th of February, Ukraine's ambassador to the UN appearing before the Security Council, pleading that, and I quote, it is the responsibility of this body to stop the war. He was interrupted in saying that by the current president of the UN Security Council, who clarified, this isn't called a war, this is called a special military operation in the Donbass. And in that moment, the Ukrainian representative was forced squarely to confront the Security Council's Janus face. The council president through whom the Ukrainian representative was required to direct his plea was none other than the Russian ambassador to the United Nations. So injury followed insult. Uh, the draft council resolution that was to be passed following that debate, seeking to deplore Russia's aggression against Ukraine and calling on Russia to cease and withdraw was of course vetoed by Russia. Now, there's controversy as to whether Russia's veto should have been recognised. Um, Article 27.3 of the Charter uh, provides that a party to a dispute should abstain from voting on decisions, uh, but it qualifies this to Charter 6 decisions. And here we're distinguishing between uh, those under Chapter 6 and those under Chapter 7. Uh, 
Those under Chapter 7 provide for binding enforcement measures, which can include measures including the use of force. Now, there was seemingly some very last minute negotiating over the, the drafting of the, this resolution. And a late change at the behest of China saw the removal of the Chapter 7 language. So there's an argument that this resolution was actually converted into one under Chapter 6. Now, only Norway raised the issue of Russia's abstention uh, or, or purported to argue that Russia should have abstained under Article 27.3 uh, and its veto should be precluded. Uh, but this wasn't taken up and Russia's veto was acknowledged and that seems to really be the final nail in the coffin for Article 27.3. So the argument is that that's fallen into disuse. Uh, its last deployment in the council was in 1960. So the question here is what do we do when the, count, uh, when the world's council of war becomes a council at war? Again, is this a case where we're seeing basically the breakdown uh, of the United Nations framework? Uh, in terms of cancel culture, there are a number of arguments. First of all, it was argued Russia uh, should be cancelled. So there was a brief debate that the Russian Federation was not actually the rightful holder uh, of the Security Council seat. Uh, advocates of this position referred to the text of the Charter in Article 23, the reference to the holder of the seat being the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Now, this argument really was given short shrift. Uh, it's clear that the Alma protocols recognize uh, the Russian Federation as the successor to the former USSR, uh, and uh, the law of succession clearly recognizes uh, that the Russian Federation is the rightful holder of the seat. Another argument was that Russia should be suspended from the United Nations. There is a possibility, of course, under Article 5 for uh, member states to be suspended, but the Security Council has to sign off on that suspension. Rebecca Barber has raised the possibility of refusing to recognise the credentials of the Putin administration, effectively preventing it from representing the Russian Federation in the General Assembly. And she cites the example of South Africa, uh, where in the 1970s, the General Assembly consistently declined to accept South Africa's credentials. And in 1974, the General Assembly president uh, ruled that this meant South Africa was excluded from participating in the work of the UN. Beyond Russia itself being cancelled, still others have started arguing for more systemic change in the UN and the international legal order. So in brief, the veto, the council, and perhaps the UN itself should be cancelled. We're already seeing calls for a coalition or league of democracies to replace the United Nations and movements encouraging a wholesale defense of liberal democracy are growing. So in December, 2021, President Biden convened the first ever summit for democracy, including leaders from hundred governments with the aim of strengthening democracy and defending against authoritarianism. The Cold War bloc mentality is re-emerging with the added risk of a new front in Asia. Now, this hand wringing about international law and its institutions is not, of course, uncommon at moments of global crisis. But I want to conclude by just providing three reasons why we might wish the UN and Russia's role within it to endure. The first is to recognize international law as balance of power and the importance of a balance of power in international relations. So we have a formal notion of equality between states recognized in international law, but in the charter, this gives way uh, to the recognition that some states are more equal than others. So as is well known, the P5 each have the capacity to veto any proposed action by the Security Council. The balance of power installed in the UN framework is a deliberate one. While the council is given responsibility to address situations of war, its primary aim, and this is in the UN charter's opening edict, uh, the aim of the UN is to save succeeding generations from world war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind. So, so the council wasn't developed to displace power politics, but to institutionalize it. Now that's not to say that the UN must effectively launder any P5 action, no matter how egregious or unlawful through the implicit promise of council inaction. While the council structure institutes a balance of power in council decision-making, the vesting of primary responsibility by the council wasn't intended to create a mechanism through which P5 members could simply pursue their own fundamental interests. 
Rather, my argument here is that in situations where a P5 member is implicated in a threat to the peace or an act of aggression, a balance of power in addressing the issue must be sought elsewhere. So here, the General Assembly is the obvious candidate. And as we well know, this is, of course, what has happened. On 27th of February, the Council passed a resolution acknowledging that lack of unanimity among the permanent members prevented it from exercising its primary responsibility and referring the question to the General Assembly. We know that the General Assembly in turn has accepted this responsibility, passing a resolution which in UN terms, I think we can consider overwhelming, a vote of 141 states in favour to five against with 35 abstentions. The second brief point I want to reflect on is the role of international law and its role in being a language for disagreement. So rather than the cancellation of international law, uh, the futility of international law, we see law as the language through which we articulate disagreement. So when an individual in domestic settings commits a crime, we don't cast them out of society into some form of Median exile. And the same logic should hold where states violate international law. To act otherwise risks transforming the international community into, anarchic, into an anarchic community of states and rogue states. So the current West-East divide in international relations will become something more like a West-Wild West divide. And as Veronica has pointed out, uh, the point of fact is that Putin didn't brush international law aside when he launched the operation, but structured his justifications using international law. And that's not to say we should accept his international law arguments, but nor did we accept the arguments raised by NATO states and coalitions uh, when they deployed force to secure regime change in Kosovo, Afghanistan and Iraq. These arguments serve as a point of reference when the international community determines whether uh, the legal position or the need for response. My final point is that law provides a justification for coercion. So perhaps more practically, international law uh, is, we recognize it as a decentralized system. It doesn't have its own army, police force, or compulsory system of courts. And therefore, uh, international law relies for its enforcement on consensus for action. In, in normal times, the Security Council might be available to provide in a more efficient function that consensus. But here, we've now uh, given responsibility to the international community at large, uh, acting through the General Assembly. And the importance of that is that where action is taken to enforce international law, it carries its own legitimacy that would be lost if the action was justified on grounds of ideology, religion, or military might. So international law and its mechanisms has the potential to provide a framework for global action that avoids setting state against state. I'll leave it thank you. Thank you very much, Devika. <clears throat> Once more, a very excellent intervention. So many things you know you you address. I'm sure you know we'll have many questions on that. And on that note, I, I don't. I want to do justice. I want to give the floor to Yuval Shani, who has to leave us also a little bit earlier. So, from the institutional perspectives, I think we move towards the judicial interventions and other issues you know related both to ICL, use of force, and human rights. Yuval, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. And uh, I, uh, I associate myself with earlier comments about the awkwardness of discussing law in times of a great humanitarian crisis. Uh, maybe before talking about the institutions and uh, some of the legal processes that have been taking place, uh, maybe I can say just a, a couple of words on the um, also on the use of the bellum issue. And uh, I, I wanted to, um, to to, to make the observation that the comment about the death of uh, Article 24 or Article 51 or the uh, inutility of the of the UN Char Charter framework, uh, I, I find it uh, quite hard to accept these uh, these observations because I consider that the problem that we have on our hands is ultimately not a question of international law but a question of international politics. I mean, there is uh, clearly here um, uh, a mandate to uh, use force in self-defense. Uh, there is a mandate here to use uh, force in collective self-defense. Um, I'm not sure that the Security Council resolution, even if it would have been, it, if it wouldn't have been blocked, uh, would have changed dramatically the uh, authority to use force. Uh, it may have, have had some uh, uh, impact on the sanctions front, but uh, we are seeing very strong sanctions. Actually, 
uh, as strong as we have seen. Uh, we have seen also um, military support, uh, which is really uh, dancing around the borderline of what is active participation or not. Uh, so again, I, I don't think that this is a case where international law as such is not functioning. The case is that international law, or maybe law in more general terms, uh, has, has pol certain political limits when it comes to confront uh, very strong actors. Uh, and in international relations, when you are dealing with a nuclear superpower that doesn't play uh, by the rules, uh, I think uh, you have a serious problem Again, not with the law, but with the political context uh, in which the law uh, operates. I mean, you could argue that what we are seeing today is 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 a long term failure of other areas of the law, which have, have not been successful in promoting nuclear disarmament, uh, have not been successful in promoting a right to democracy, have not been uh, maybe successful on a regional level in integrating the Russian Federation in the West after the Cold War. Uh, but but putting uh, putting uh, hanging um, this failure, I think, on uh, on the structure of the law itself, uh, I have I have my uh, my doubts. Uh, I would say that the law has been uh, to some extent um, useful, uh, perhaps in uh, providing some legitimacy uh, for sanctions, and maybe part of the success of international sanctions have to is related to the. Um, strong sense that very fundamental uh, principles of international law are at stake. And maybe also Article 5 of the NATO uh, Treaty uh, is also uh, important in, in drawing a line in the sand, so to speak, so as to contain the scope of the hostilities. Uh, of course, this is something that we will um, uh, have to uh, see in the future. Uh, another common refrain that we have heard in discussions about this, and, and this has to do with um, also with the article, uh, um, the death of Article 2.4, or the or rumors about the death of 2.4 are, uh, uh, are to have been uh, made too soon, are premature. Uh, and this is about um, why are we uh, coming down so as an international community so strongly on Russia and that there hasn't been uh, the same reaction uh, with regard to uh, previous violations. And I also think that this is a discourse which is uh, not, not ultimately persuasive. Uh, and I would say perhaps uh, two things on that. First, there are different, even within the world of violations. I mean, it's not, a, it's on an, it's not an on-off switch. There are different gradations of violations. And I think what we are seeing in the Ukraine uh, is 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 an extreme violation in terms of the egregiousness and the uh, lack of uh, of a plausible justification, uh, which uh, which is part of uh, of of the um, of, of the reason why the reaction has been so strong. Uh, I, I would note in that regard that um, e even with regard to, to the Russian Federation, the, the, there is a very different um, form of reaction that we are seeing here than what we have seen uh, in Georgia in 2008 uh, in, and in Crimea in 2014. Uh, so, so even within the reaction to, to the Russian Federation, there appears to be a difference that emanates uh, from the scope of hostilities, but also perhaps from the pattern that is, uh, that is emerging. Uh, with regard to the other violations that have been cited in the discourse involving, uh, for instance, uh, uh, NATO member states in 1999 and, and the invasion of Iraq in, in 2003, um, I, I wouldn't support any of these uh, uh, military uh, operations or, or, or acts of hostility. Um, but, but I would argue at least that there would have been a plausible case in, in, in all of these instances. There has been a plausible case. I don't think it's, uh, it's very persuasive, but there has been a plausible case that uh, the state that we're using force in these uh, contexts uh, were actually uh, playing the role, uh, uh, stepping inside the shoes of the Security Council. They were actually uh, taking, uh, taking functions that the Security Council uh, was not able to, to, to entertain. So that, that has to do with humanitarian intervention in one context and the disarmament of, uh, of Iraq in the second context. Uh, again, it's not a plausible argument, but I think it's a very different argument from the one that we can be uh, thinking about in this present uh, scenario where, where it's really, um, it, it's re it goes far beyond the, the, the boundaries of imagination to, to regard Russia as imposing somehow uh, stepping inside the shoes of the Security Council. And so I think there are, uh, context is important and, and, and there are different uh, uh, degrees of uh, not all, um, not all violations are, are, are the same. 
uh, with regard to the reaction of uh, the um, of, uh, of of legal institutions, uh, I will say. Uh, I think there are two issues, where, uh, two points which are interesting. One is the uh, discussion over the crime of aggression. Uh, I think this is something that uh, has been picking up momentum. Uh, as, as, as we know, uh, the, the uh, ICC statute does have currently a crime uh, of aggression uh, under 8bis, but uh, it is not likely to be uh, implemented in the present uh, conflict because of the fact that the Security Council refer referral is, is not likely, and because both Russia and the Ukraine are not state parties. Hence, the, uh, the, the proposal that was raised um, in, uh, in some academic circles, also enjoying some political support within the UK, uh, of establishing a, a special tribunal for the purpose of trying the Russian leadership for the crime of aggression. Uh, I think that's an interesting uh, uh, project which um, I, I think uh, deals with the idea that the rule of law has to be uh, reasserted. And it has to be reasserted vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the most dramatic, the most um, uh, egregious violations that we have seen here. And the most egregious violation that we have seen here has not been the war crimes. There are, of course, war crimes that are serious, and it's good that the ICC is investigating them. But really seizing the bull by the horn, uh, the, the great violation that we are seeing is the crime is the is the act of aggression and therefore uh, if we if we are uh, if we would uh, want to use this project to this, this crisis sorry to um, to revalidate the project of uh, international uh, law as as, uh, as 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 a limit on naked state power i think going down that path is important at least exploring that that down that path uh, it has, I mean, I don't think we have time to really uh, discuss the, the very uh, nuances of the proposal. I will just note that uh, it is built in part on the fact that the Ukrainian criminal code in itself has a crime of aggression, uh, and such a tribunal could be a tribunal which is a mixed tribunal, uh, uh, like those who were established before vis -a -vis in, in relation to Cambodia or uh, Lebanon or uh, Sierra Leone, uh, with some support of states or the international community at large. Uh, there would be questions of immunity, but there are always questions of immunity or the practical ability to, uh, to um, bring to justice serving, uh, serving leaders. Uh, and there would also be there are also concerns about selectivity, which I think are, uh, are, are, are legitimate, but again, not overriding. I mean, you have to start somewhere and the law has been developing. And, and in fact, the ICC statute only uh, has this provision uh, in, in force for the last four years. And, and again, you have the Ukrainian code to, to uh, hang on. The final point which I want to make is that another front, which I think a uh, legal front, which is interesting and so far has not been discussed extensively, is the front of uh, human rights courts. Uh, as you know, uh, the previous conflicts uh, that uh, Russia was involved with uh, in Georgia and in the, in the Donbass region and Crimea have generated extensive litigation uh, before the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, it is likely that there will be, well, we know that there, are already, uh, there is already an interstate case which has been brought forward by the Ukraine, and there will probably be many, many individual cases. I do know that Russia has uh, indicated its uh, intent to withdraw from the Council of Europe and, and also from the court, but this would only take effect within six months, so the cases will uh, be piling up. I think an interesting issue that would have to be uh, examined in this question is whether the general comment 36 of the Human Rights Committee, uh, which uh, I, I was involved in drafting, uh, would be um, would be uh, considered in, in this specific context, and I'm referring uh, directly to paragraph 70 of the general comment, which does take the position that uh, in an act of aggression, every deprivation of the right to life uh, is uh, an arbitrary deprivation because the illegality of the aggression itself does color the deprivation of life which ensues as an arbitrary form of the of, uh, of deprivation. Uh, and that would actually uh, apply uh, directly both to Ukrainian uh, citizens and military, but to, to some extent also to Russian military personnel who have been uh, in a way uh, uh, indirect victims of, uh, of this, uh, of this um, uh, unlawful uh, war that has been conducted uh, by Russia. Again, I'm not so optimistic about actually uh, uh, obtaining um, decisions and compensations uh, from, from Russia on this account, 
but I think that this is uh, this is a principle that uh, would be uh, very uh, well to establish. Maybe just as a final uh, comment, and with this I will return the floor to you, Maria, uh, is that uh, although we have been seeing in this conflict the demise of the golden arch theory, and a number of uh, numerous commentators have commented on, on, the, on the fact that this uh, idea of golden arch theory is no longer plausible, although maybe the closing of McDonald's in, in, in Russia would uh, uh, resuscitate it. But I think we, did, we are seeing quite strongly the, the more, uh, the, 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 the previous uh, Kantian observation in perpetual peace about the linkage between uh, um, a Republican co constitution that is based on, 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 on consent of the governed and, the, uh, and conditions for world peace and, and it is actually quite dramatic and quite uh, uh, shattering to see the correlation between the, the growing acts of aggression in Ukraine and the growing oppression inside Russia. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Yuval. You touched upon many, many interesting uh, points and, and, and developments, and <clears throat> especially General Common 36, but also you know the final observation about uh, domestic uh, oppression in, in, in Russia, and this is something that we do not talk a lot. Uh, having said that, you know, uh, in the interest of time, I want immediately to give the floor to Tim McCormack, who is joining us from Tasmania quite late over there. Uh, Tim, apart from being a very well-known professor of international law, he's also a special advisor on crime, so the prosecutor of the ICC many years now. Tim, thank you very much for joining us, and you have the floor with interesting developments before the ICC. Thank you. Thanks very much, Maria, and uh, thanks for the privilege of um, joining you in London this morning, your time, the evening, my time. Uh, it's, a, it's an honour to be on the same panel with uh, Veronica, Davika, Yuval, Jan and yourself. Uh, let me just explain briefly that the International Criminal Court does have jurisdiction over genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity, although it does not over the crime of aggression in this particular situation. Yuval just explained Article 8 bis and it's Article 15 bis of the Rome Statute that has the jurisdictional constraints about the way the, the circumstances, the limited, very narrow circumstances in which the court can exercise jurisdiction over that particular crime. But although neither Ukraine nor Russia are states parties to the Rome Statute, Ukraine has made a declaration ad hoc accepting the jurisdiction of the court. And so on that basis, once the um, prosecutor of the ICC was given approval to open a formal criminal investigation with an unprecedented 39 co-signatories among states parties, he was able to commit to sending an investigative team to, to, to begin that process of formal investigation. Should say that although I am his special advisor on war crimes, I'm certainly not appearing in that capacity. I'm participating uh, in this panel in a personal capacity and nothing that I say can be attributed to his office. I hope that's understood. One important question to make, one important observation to make about uh, jurisdiction over war crimes is that all parties to the international armed conflict are bound by international humanitarian law and by the terms of Article 8 of the Rome Statute and serious violations by any of them constitute war crimes. And so when the investigation is undertaken, it will not only look at allegations against the Russian side. I'm not trying to suggest that Ukraine's also perpetrating war crimes, just that the investigation will need to be open to evidence that comes to the investigators. It's really interesting to me that in the um, announcement of the ICC investigation opening in Ukraine, a whole stack of other organisations, multilateral organisations, individual states, NGOs, um, even different um, Ukrainian organisations are all attempting to undertake their own investigations or to do whatever they can to help collect and to preserve evidence that might be used in support of any international or indeed any national attempt to prosecute alleged war crimes in Ukraine. And I think the level of commitment to that is fascinating. Good, good to ask why, and I'm glad that you've all started to ask that question. In terms of the nature of allegations that have, that have surfaced in the last fortnight, they've largely been focused on 
targeting decisions at attacks on hospitals and medical centres, attacks on schools, attacks on civilian, civilians attempting to flee through ostensibly designated humanitarian corridors, on civilian residential areas, on nuclear power plants. And there have also been allegations of the use of particularly egregious weapons. So allegations of the use of cluster munitions in resident, civilian residential areas, uh, one allegation of the use of thermobaric or fuel air explosive weapons, particularly um, intensive and damaging in a, in a built up residential area. Also been talk of the threat of use of chemical weapons and even the threat potentially of the use of nuclear weapons. There are a set of real challenges for international criminal court investigators. One, of course, is to establish the crime base, to, to, to be able to gather the evidence that proves that certain violations of the Rome Statute were actually perpetrated. But in addition to that, and I think always more challenging for the investigators, uh, is the gathering of evidence about who was most responsible for the alleged war crimes and whether or not we can gather sufficient evidence to mount a reasonable case to prove individual criminal responsibility. So linking criminal responsibility to those most responsible for the alleged war crimes, often or almost invariably, not the physical perpetrators of the offences themselves, is always a major challenge in a, in a crisis like this. You asked me, Maria, to, to focus on some of the implications for international law arising out of this particular subject matter. And I've been thinking about that in preparation for tonight. What, what's the, what is the effect of recurrent and relentless serious violation of international humanitarian law, the Yulsin Bellow, on the normative value of, of prohibited conduct? If what happens in response to that time and time again uh, is only hand wringing on the part of the international community. So condemnation in words without actions to, to, to attempt to try to enforce the, that normative um, framework. I think about the Syrian conflict uh, now in its 12th year, an appalling and um, an appalling crisis regularly featuring egregious violations of international humanitarian law. Uh, the International Criminal Court with no jurisdiction, despite successive attempts by the French through the UN Security Council to refer the situation, those attempts being vetoed by Russia and China. But there are some states, and Germany I think is exemplary in this, that have attempted to use universal jurisdiction to try individuals from the Syrian conflict as a way of demonstrating their commitment to this uh, normative legal framework. And I think more states should take um, a leaf out of the German approach to this and, and if they're serious about a commitment to trying to reinforce the normative value of the, of the legal framework. It seems to me in the current crisis, it's, there's a certain irony that this situation has uh, resulted in unprecedented level of cooperation to support the International Criminal Court. Even the US is speaking explicitly about support for international efforts to prosecute war crimes and other international crimes in the Ukrainian context. And only last year, they were in their own, uh, in their own process of total disparagement of the International Criminal Court over ICC jurisdiction in Afghanistan. The unprecedented number of state parties that refer the situation in Ukraine is also a new step. And every statement that Karim Khan, the prosecutor, seems to make is applauded with governments across the board trying to express their support. Yuval talked about the calls for an ad hoc international tribunal on the crime of aggression. And I think it is a really fascinating development given the restrictions and limitations in Article 15 bis of the Rome Statute. I wonder whether this call and the exploration of the possibilities of it might expose the limitations of that definition and possibly be the catalyst for reform of that particular provision of the of the Rome Statute. Maybe that's totally naive of me, but um, I wonder whether that might happen. But like other speakers before me, I also have some misgivings. 
the fact is that war crimes, are, I mean, misgivings about talking about this subject matter. War crimes are, of course, being committed every day in many other conflicts. Many of those conflicts are protracted and, uh, and, the, uh, and the violations egregious. Uh, and yet none of them have evoked this level of attention. And perhaps Yuval is correct in his analysis of why that might be the case, giving, given the, the gradation of egregious conduct in the initial invasion of Ukraine. I think when we focus on war crimes, and I'm not just talking about myself in my capacity as special advisor on war crimes to the prosecutor, but there's so much media coverage in the last few days on war crimes and the possibility of prosecution and Vladimir Putin appearing before the International Criminal Court. I think sometimes the focus on war crimes and on individual accountability hides the reality that terrible suffering is being inflicted because there's a war. And much of that suffering has nothing to do with egregious violations of international humanitarian law. It's because Russia has chosen to invade Ukraine and people's lives are completely disrupted by that. And I think sometimes I, I, I try to remind myself not to focus exclusively on the questions of substantive criminality or on individual criminal accountability and lose sight of the context of the suffering in which that's happening. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, once more, a very um, reflective uh, intervention. And I wish we had so much more time to, to discuss about that because Yuval is going to leave at 11 o'clock. I put on, uh, on chat that if you have any questions that you want to address to him, please write it now. And having said that, I would like to give the floor now to Jan Klambers who is going to talk about an institution, a different institution of international organizations reaction, you know, to what we experienced the last two weeks. Jan, you have. Thank you, Maria. Thank, uh, thanks to all the previous speakers as well for their uh, considered uh, contributions. I learned a lot already. Um, my own angle is a bit different. As some of you may know, I do international organizations law for a living. And part of international organizations law is always that international organizations carry the promise of universal peace. And since I'm also a little bit of a nerd, I thought about a week and a half ago that I should look at the websites of about a number of international organizations and I ended up looking at 50 of them to see how they responded initially. So this was about a week after the start of the, the conflict uh, to Russia's uh, aggression. So I went through a number of international organizations. I went through a bunch of uh, commodity organizations, such as the International Olive Council, the International Grains Council, the International Cocoa Organization, and a few more. And it will not surprise you to hear that those were just doing their business as usual. Their websites would list the regular statistics, the price development of cocoa worldwide, that sort of thing but nothing whatsoever on the conflict. I went to the website of a number of regional organizations. Um, some of those were not saying an awful lot. Um, like the Nordic Investment Bank uh, had as it's one of its headlines, the issuing of environmental bonds, which is what it does. Uh, NAFO, the Northwestern Atlantic Fisheries Organization uh, advertised a couple of vacancies on its website. So nothing terribly exciting there. A bunch of other organizations, regional organizations, though, issued statements condemning uh, Russia or expressing concern or uh, expressing concern, the African Union expressed concern for African refugees, that sort of thing. And the only regional organization that I looked at, and I did not look at the European Union because I don't consider that an international organization anymore, uh, was the, the Council of Europe, which uh, was discussing a suspension of Russian membership. Some of the others were interesting. The Arctic Council, which is chaired at the moment by Russia, did not say anything at that time. I'll get back to that in a moment. And the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is Russia and China's vehicle for, uh, uh, for something, I guess, uh, also did not list anything whatsoever, interestingly or not. And then I had a look at a bunch of universal organizations, including specialized agencies. Most of them were just conducting business as usual, with, for instance, the World Customs Organization 
reminding us that it will be World Wildlife Day anytime soon. Um, some had a more substantive response, UNHCR saying it would be doing humanitarian assistance, the World Trade Organization expressing concern for the trade effects, the International Maritime Organization expressing concern for the fate of seafarers, and that sort of thing. And the only, and this is going to baffle you, the only international organization of more or less universal scope that was discussing whether to affect the status of Russia as a member state was the drum roll. The World Tourism Organization of all organizations. That was the only one that I found that was considering suspending Russia's membership, or at least the rights uh, stemming from membership. Now, the nerd that I am decided to do a little random check this morning, whether something had changed, um, whether UNIDO, for instance, the, the Industrial Development Organization, would still merely refer on its uh, website to the pineapple sector in Suriname, which of course is a very viable topic for a conversation. Uh, so the Arctic Council, chaired, as I said, by Russia this term, uh, has suspended itself. There shall be no meetings, no operations whatsoever of the Arctic Council for the foreseeable future. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization still says nothing. Its headline was the fight against counter or the, the, the counterterrorism struggle, whatever that may mean in that particular context. The World Customs Organization now issued a statement, a sort of guarded statement, uh, expressing concern for the situation in Ukraine, but without mentioning Russia. The International Labour Organization has a short statement by its Director General condemning Russia. The World Meteorological Organization says nothing whatsoever. The UN World Tourism Organization is now organizing a special session to discuss Russia's continued membership. And the Industrial Development Organization still discusses the pineapple sector in Suriname. Now, what does that leave? Where does that leave us? That leaves us probably with the idea that the dream of universal peace brought to you by international organizations may not immediately depend on the activities of those organizations. Perhaps it depends more on their very existence. And that has been the theory all along, of course, that they would create networks of independence, which would lurch on to a Kantian peace ideal and the world would be a better place. Well, maybe I have not disproven that. I have no intention of disproving that either. But it struck me as rather surprising that of the 50 organizations I looked at, only the World Tourism Organization and the Council of Europe were doing something about the status of Russia as a member state. Um, having said that, the Russians are, of course, announced to be withdrawing, have been reportedly thinking about withdrawing from the Council of Europe. We'll see whether that materializes, how that materializes. The relevant provisions in the Council of Europe statute are not terribly clearly drafted. Um, and then I read this morning that Australia and Holland, in a related move, are taking the downing of the MH17, already almost a decade ago, I think, to the ICAO Council, which is the executive body of the International Civil Aviation Organization, which deals in dispute settlement under Article 84 of the ICAO Constitution. And that makes you wonder about the timing. Why now? And one possible explanation might be that Holland and Australia have realized that Russia will not have an awful lot of support within ICAO at the moment. So this is as good a time as any to bring a case there. I stop here and give the floor back to Maria. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan, for these developments before <coughs> the international institutions. And I would like to give the floor uh, before I proceed to Yuval, because has to go. There is a question addressed to him. Uh, Yuval, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. And again, apologies to all that I have to leave, uh, but that's uh, um, the nature of uh, such events uh, taking place on short notice. Uh, um, so on the question of the, the linkage between uh, abuses by the West or violations by the West and accountability uh, in Ukraine, I, I think there is obviously a linkage. I mean, once you start, um, once you start going down that path, I mean, it's, uh, it's a slippery slope. 
um, I, I do, like I said before, I think there are, uh, um, there are uh, variations in, in, in the level uh, of um, egregiousness. Uh, I think this is a, a, I mean, a good, I mean, uh, I think there is a, a lesson to be learned here about the price, the long-term price that one is paying for uh, for uh, working around the rules. And this is, I think, a cautionary tale. But having said that, it of course doesn't uh, doesn't uh, mean that one has doesn't have to uh, uphold uh, the law whenever uh, it can, and that one does not um, have to uh, reverse trend. I, I think the, the reason why we are seeing uh, such a strong reaction here is that this is not only about a violation of the law. I think there is a, there is a sense that this is uh, also a strong a, a violation of something which is uh, very deep about uh, world order and about morality in international relations. So I think this the combination of the three uh, is, is actually uh, dr driving the push to, to uh, accountability. But of course, uh, it is encumbered by, uh, by, by past instances of uh, unlawfulness and, uh, and uh, uh, this is, of course, uh, an, an unfortunate legacy that the West is carrying with it when it is approaching these sort of issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yuval. I know you have to, to leave us uh, now. Thank you very much for your observations. Uh, <clears throat> there is a question also addressed to Yuval, but it's something you know that I, I will take the floor now uh, and uh, um, I'm going uh, to talk a little bit uh, briefly as well about the ICJ proceedings. And then I'm going to open again the discussion, the floor for the question and discussion. Some questions uh, I will urge, you know, the, um, the presenters, you know, to check if they can, the Q&A, you know, so they can see, see some questions that are particularly addressed from, um, to them. So as you know, you know, we have also apart from the ICC, apart from the European Court of Human Rights, apart from developments before the Human Rights Council, uh, apart from the initiative that you all, you've all talked about, about the special tribunal aggression <clears throat> for Ukraine and Russia, we had also a very interesting development and that was, that was the proceedings, uh, the application of Ukraine for provisional measures uh, before um, the ICJ uh, against uh, Ukraine, uh, utilizing, you know, Article 9 of the Genocide Convention. That was a very, very uh, interesting uh, development. Uh, and it was interesting about the claim, the, about the main claim of, um, of Ukraine, while they tried, you know, they brought the, the, the aggression um, um, argument via the genocidal jurisdictional uh, clause. Now, uh, having said that, what I want to draw your attention here is very much, I think, most likely this is what commentators, but this is my gut feeling, says, most likely the court will proceed uh, with the provision of measures. What this was very in interesting, what was that the Russia did not show up, they did not appear. However, afterwards, they were not before, they did not participate in the oral hearing. However, afterwards, they submitted uh, um, their, their own uh, file. Uh, they had their own submission. And here, you know, you can see that both sides, they focus a lot on the duty to prevent, the duty to prevent uh, the crime of, uh, of genocide. Uh, what does it mean? And somehow the course, and to what extent it's related to the use of force, to what extent, you know, state have a, have a duty to prevent genocide by recoursing to military force. And we saw that both Ukraine, which was quite interesting was represented you know by uh, professor harold Koh uh, and purely an american legal team but also russia uh, somehow they made you know uh, the same argument that there is no uh, use of force when it comes you know to the prevention there is no duty of use of force when it comes to the prevention of genocide actually in their sub in the russian submission we saw that the only argument they use is not genocide and they claim that the reference of genocide by President and Putin were just uh, plain references. They were not related, you know, to the normative reference we have in the Genocide Convention. And they say our own legal justification for intervening, for invading Ukraine was self-defense, okay, under Article 51. And actually our ambassador before the Security Council, you know, before the UN uh, <clears throat> informed, you know, the UN about our legal uh, basis for invading Ukraine. 
So we are going to see what will happen with the use of force. This is actually an issue that all students, when we teach them, you know, about the prevention, the, the genocide convention, or when we go, they link it to the responsibility to protect. But always I was very careful about this legal duty, you know, uh, to intervene by military force. And I think this is a very interesting development and I hope you know that um, the ICJ, you know, already sort of that's up on this issue in the Bosnia versus genocide uh, versus Serbia case. But I think this is something, you know, that we are going to see uh, in those proceedings. So basically, Russia says there is no dispute, you know, because there is no uh, dispute, there is no jurisdiction based on the genocide uh, convention. And for us, it was not the genocide. It was basically self-defense. On the other hand, Ukraine said there is no use of force, you know, when it comes to uh, to preventing genocide based on uh, uh, misinterpretation and falsification, you know, of the genocide claim. And I stop here. Now, uh, having said that, you know, I would like again to, to give the floor uh, to our speakers. Uh, we can also engage there are some, as I say, questions that they are addressed to uh, some of them uh, um, in particular. But I would like also, we have some time, I would like also to engage in a discussion and also for the speakers amongst themselves. I don't know who would like to take the floor, maybe. Maybe, Devika, can I start with you? Because there was a question about the Security Council and Russia seats on the Security Council. Is that okay if I start with you? Yes, of course. I'm just going to the Q&A. So there was a question from Natasha Kurt on the Security Council seat issue. Isn't it the case that Russia is the continuator of the USSR while the other 11 republics were the successor states, which is why they had to apply, but Russia didn't, as only one state can be a continuation of the UN member state? Uh, the India-Pakistan case was mentioned. Um, so yes, you're absolutely right. Um, in the case of the Commonwealth of Independent States, um, it was Russia that uh, was the successor states and the other 11 states had to basically apply for membership. Um, and you've mentioned the India-Pakistan case. So this is taking us back to 1947, uh, where India uh, took over the UN seat um, and Pakistan had to reapply for membership. And so the UN Legal Council in that case um, said that the territory which breaks away uh, will be the new state that has to apply. So basically in the law relating to succession of the seat, there seems to be a differentiation between state continuity, state continuity, sorry, or dissolution. So, you know, when Montenegro separated from Serbia, um, when South Sudan separated from Sudan, uh, the former had to, to reapply for membership, whereas the latter continued the seat. But if we contrast uh, situations of dissolution, so Czechoslovakia, for example, uh, and uh, maybe Mali and Senegal, you had basically a dissolution and the two states having to reapply uh, to the United Nations. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much, Vivica. Uh, Tim, I think there are some questions about um, IHL, but also if I can take the, uh, if I can use my uh, privilege here, you know, I think we have some interesting development when it comes to uh, foreign fighters um, slash uh, mercenaries, uh, allegation, you know, foreign fighters of the International Legion, you know, we see that both sides, you know, use, um, uh, invite uh, foreign fighters. Now there were allegations of mercenaries coming from uh, from Syria, uh, and generally, you know, there there is a kind of confusion when it comes to the individual status of those who participate uh, in in hostilities. Uh, this is not a new practice. However, um, also something that I found very interesting is that the development we had with uh, Facebook, if I'm correct, allowing you know inciting uh, violence against um, Russian combatants from what I understood. Is there other things you know here that you would like maybe to comment or something you would like to say? Yeah, thanks Maria. And look, I think perhaps I'll start with Yuan, um, Yuan's question about civilians in Ukraine and then talk about foreign fighters if that's okay. Uh, that question got posted quite a while ago. So thanks for your patience in waiting for an answer, Yuan. Situation in international humanitarian law is that um, civilians are immune from attack unless they take a direct part in hostilities. 
there's some uncertainty about precisely what direct participation in hostilities means, but but it unquestionably includes taking up arms. So civilians in Ukraine who take up weapons forfeit their, their, their civilian status, that is forfeit their protected status, their legal protected status, and are legitimate military targets for such time as they are involved in activities that constitute directly participating in hostilities. So from a Russian soldier's perspective, uh, they don't have to work out precisely what the legal status is of someone who's shooting at them. They, it is a legitimate use of, uh, well, it's, it's it, the, the intentional killing of that person is excused under this particular law of war and it would not constitute a war crime. It's a very important thing to understand because we're not talking about a, um, uh, a, a, a passive, a, a passive, pacified sort of situation here. The law permits certain killing, and only killing those who are, have special legal protection constitutes a war crime of murder. Now, in relation to foreign fighters, yeah, this is a really common feature of many armed, armed conflicts, um, in perhaps most of them since. World War Two, and the, uh, the well, one question about their legal status depends on the circumstances of their involvement. So we know that um, Russia is asking for volunteers, and if individuals are volunteering to fight on the side of Russian forces against Ukraine, or foreign fighters, perhaps some with Ukrainian ethnicity who are volunteering to fight on the side of the Ukrainian military then neither of those would satisfy the definition of mercenary, which is quite narrowly defined in Additional Protocol 1 to the, of 1977 to the Geneva Conventions. Um, irrespective of whether a person is a, satisfies that, that quite narrow definition of mercenary, they are, if they're participating in the fighting, whether it's part of the regular armed forces or as irregular armed forces attached to the government forces of Ukraine or the government forces of Russia, they would be a legitimate military objective as far as the opposing side is concerned. For those who satisfy the definition of mercenaries, they are not entitled to prisoner of war status if they're captured by the opposing side, but they are as, as legitimate military targets as anyone else participating in the fighting. So yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a complex, area, but um, I think we have to try and simplify it for the, for, the, uh, for the forces actually fighting on the ground. It's not a question of having a lawyer with you to decide whether this person is a civilian taking a direct part in hostilities or, or a combatant. There's also, Maria, a question, um, perhaps I'll just go on to this second one from an anonymous participant about the um, attacks on civil buildings. I, I understand that to mean public buildings, government buildings, as well as on civilian buildings, uh, and an attempt by the Russians to, uh, to justify those attacks. Um, we have in, in international humanitarian law, a definition of what constitutes a legitimate military objective. And it's a sort of two pronged definition, both elements of it must be satisfied. Uh, objects, military objectives are those objects which by their nature, location, purpose or use make an effective contribution to military action. So if we're talking about a town hall or some other civil building in Ukraine that isn't being used to contribute to the military effort by the Ukrainian side, then it is protected from attack. It's not a legitimate military objective. If it's housing ammunition or troops or, or if uh, it's being used by snipers to gain a, a height advantage to, to shoot enemy combatants, then it has forfeited any protected status it might have, and it can be, um, it can be bombed or deliberately targeted. The second element of that definition is that, um, is that the partial or total destruction, capture or neutralization of that particular objective offers a definite military advantage to the other side. And both of those elements have to be satisfied to justify an attack. I'll stop, I'll stop Maria. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tim, for that. Uh, these are very, very uh, important uh, clarifications. Um, 
I want to give the floor uh, to Veronica. Veronica could uh, would like a little bit to respond to one question about the denazification. We are very privileged because Veronica comes from Central Europe, you know, and we want also your own input. Uh, Veronica, maybe if I can uh, <clears throat> intervene here, I want to ask also about the perception of international law as well, because I want to go back to my initial question. You know, I haven't seen so many references to international law. I can give an example that initially the media requests were in our department was more about the national politics. And then at some stage they say, okay, let's go to law. You know, and I was wondering that there you feel that international law and the role of international law has a, a different dynamic, let's say, uh, uh, in, in countries of former Eastern Europe, you know, uh, and how it is utilized maybe, you know, in comparison to, to Russia than what we call, you know, the traditional former Western countries. So thank you for that. Thank you, Maria. I'll probably start from that last question, which is <laughs> indeed a question for, for an independent seminar. Uh, so I would like to start by stressing that there is not a single center or single Eastern Europe. There is not a single center or Eastern European view of international law. As I would argue, there is not a single Western European view of international law. And the same would probably go, uh, not probably, certainly go for all the other regions. So there are different views in uh, present in uh, in the same states, in the same faculties as, as everywhere else. It's true that uh, there might be some institutions of international law that are more strongly adhered to and supported in some regions, but I would argue that it has more to do, probably not so much with the historical tradition, though this is also one element, but probably with the, with the political factors, the factual power of the countries. And one of such institutions would definitely be, and that's, that's, that might sound a bit funny in, or a bit uh, sad rather than funny in the, in the given context, that's the concept of sovereignty that has traditionally been very much stressed uh, and emphasized as crucial by countries, especially of, uh, of Eastern Europe, such as the Russian Federation, such as Ukraine. So it's a bit sad to see uh, Russia trumping up in one of the values it has always stressed as crucial for the uh, for the for international law. The same goes for the prohibition of the use of force, which has always been a cornerstone of uh, the foreign policy and international law position of all the countries in the region. So much for that. Then I would like to comment on uh, some other issues. One, I'm really sorry that Yuval has left because I found his idea about these different shades of gray of violations very interesting, that different violation that we have, that the violation of the same norm might uh, be considered differently depending on some, on some circumstances that we did not have uh, the opportunity to discuss. So it, it would be very interesting to focus on this discussion or to return to this discussion. And it might be also very interesting to consider whether this these dif different shades of gray, which according to Yuval are present in the violations itself, or the, the violations themselves are also reflected in the reaction and whether there is really a clear and causal link. That means a serious violation is always, gives always rise to serious reaction or not, whether there are other factors which probably play the role, for instance, who is the one violating the rule and how big a support such an actor enjoys at the international level. So that would be the second comment. The third one, there was an early question, uh, I think the second one or the third one here, yeah, uh, about denazification and demilitarization of Ukraine. So let me say a couple of words about that. The, the terms are obviously taken from uh, the, the discourse and from statements made by the Russian President Putin and by the other Russian representatives and repeated again and again. And I would say that these terms, denazification on the one hand and demilitarization on the other hand, are actually the domestic variations or the, the domestic versions of the two legal arguments presented externally. So they are the same thing, but for the domestic uh, audience in Russia. So denazification would correspond to the first legal title that Russia invokes internationally. That means the collective self-defense in support of the two 
uh, so-called People's Re Republic uh, republics in the eastern part of Ukraine, the Luhansk and the Donetsk republics. You will certainly re remember that three days prior to aggression, uh, prior to the attack on Ukraine, Russia had recognized these republics as independent states. So the argument is that the people living in these two originally provinces of Ukraine, later on independent states, were actually under oppression and violence and uh, even an armed attack from the Kiev uh, government, from the Kiev regime, which allegedly is uh, full of Nazi people. So the denazification means actually a liberation of the people of Ukraine, especially in these two people's republics, but probably more broadly in Ukraine, from the current Kiev regime, which is not seen as legitimate by the Russian Federation. So much for the denazification. The other title, demilitarization, corresponds on its turn to the other legal uh, ground invoked by the Russian Federation, that means the preventive self-defense. So Russia argues that Ukraine, by uh, aligning with, with NATO, by allowing uh, the NATO to operate on its territory, and especially by uh, announcing its intention to consider regaining uh, nuclear weapons, that by all these, Russia, uh, the Ukraine constitutes a, a potential threat uh, for, for, uh, uh, for Russia in future. So it's necessary to attack once uh, while there is still time, and it's necessary to demilitarize demilitarize, yes, uh, Ukraine, uh, so to make sure that it does not constitute a security threat for, for Russia any longer. So actually, there are the, the two labels are the domestic version of the legal justification that Russia provides externally. And as I mentioned in my presentation, neither of these two legal grounds holds, in my opinion. The first one falls uh, on, on factual grounds. The, the latter one both on factual and on legal grounds. I would leave it at that for the moment. Thank you very much, Veronica, for this clarification on the answer. There is a question about sanctions. So Jan, I uh, would like to, to respond about that. And there is also a question, a final, a last question about uh, the involvement, you know, of uh, other uh, states by supplying weapons, you know, to uh, Ukraine, to what extent, you know, they become legitimate um, uh, party, legitimate uh, parties, adversary parties in the conflict. So, Jan, I can give you the floor for the sanctions. Thank you. Thanks to Rachel for the, the question. Rachel and I go a long way back, so it's nice to be uh, meeting in this uh, somewhat strange setting, perhaps. Um, the answer would probably be something to the effect that even severe sanctions are most likely not to be regarded as use of force. And I build that on two considerations. One is the discussions in the, um, uh, leading up to the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, where Article 52, you might recall, suggests something to the effect that treaties uh, procured through use of force against the state are uh, null and void. And that led to a discussion on what then constitutes use of force. And it turned out that the use of force conception in the law of treaties under Article 52 would have to be very minimalist, that the use of political pressure, the use of all that sort of thing was not to be considered force. So that's one strand of the argument. If it's in the law of treaties, not force, it's probably not force elsewhere either. Um, the other is a, a general notion of proportionality that is interwoven in international law in, in pretty much everything that happens. Self-defense has to be proportional. Uh, all sorts of things have to be proportional. And one can hardly argue that even severe sanctions would ever um, cross that threshold when measured against the actual use of force. So I, I would intuitively say uh, it might require some further study, but it would uh, intuitively be my position that um, even severe sanctions will, will not be considered use of force and thus be considered legal under international law. Maria, do you mind if I jump in here? Of course, Devika, please. 
I find this to be such a fascinating issue um, and it's potentially a bit controversial to say it, but there is a slight issue with these unilateral sanctions because funnily enough, any sanctions not issued by the Security Council are unilateral, including those, for example, by the EU. Uh, so then we're getting into the landscape of countermeasures. And as Yana said, that's where we find a proportionality criteria creeping in. But another element of countermeasures uh, is that the sanctioning state has to establish itself as an injured state. Um, and so there is a slight question as to whether and how uh, states that are not themselves being attacked establish themselves as an injured state. Uh, and there's also that criteria with countermeasures that fundamental human rights norms need to be satisfied. So I'm thinking about sanctioning of oligarchs where I've been engaged in a few discussions about this uh, when blanket sanctions against oligarchs are being proposed. And that suggestion that there might have to be a link established between their capacity to influence Putin and the aggression against Ukraine. I just want to throw that into the mix. May, may I respond to that again? Yes, of course, please. To, to add to something Devika said, not to distract from it or to detract from it. Maybe this is the point where the doctrine of erga omnis obligations might actually be of some use. Um, that was launched, as, as you all know, by the International Court in 1970 and has never been given much hands and feet in state practice, except precisely when it comes to uh, justifying unilater unilateral sanctions. I remember the, the, the sanctions the EU imposed against Yugoslavia in the mid 90s or early 90s, which could only find their justification in something like an erga omnis type of reasoning that you know, what was happening in Yugoslavia at the time, what is happening, what Russia is doing right now, does not just uh, lead to directly injured parties, but also to something a bit more vital, a bit more all encompassing, maybe vital is not the word, but a bit more all encompassing than just a direct victim state. That, that notion of, of international law being purely bilateral in nature, what, what Devika um, refers to, I guess, it, it is very strong, but whether it is still completely acceptable is a, is a different story. Maybe I'll throw that in. Okay, uh, thank you about that. Um, I know there is a question we have, uh, I would say five more minutes, Kim is joining us quite late from Tasmania. Uh, and there is a question about the temporary protection directive that has to do with the European Union and the reception of uh, refugees from Ukraine. Patrick, he asked this question. Definitely we're talking about double standards. There's no doubt about that. I mean, the uh, sorry, I have to switch on my camera. The directive was never actually substantiated, activated, although it has a di directive many years now, uh, decades now. Um, and th there, is a, there is a discourse, there is a debate, there is a controversy over there. Why do we have that for Ukraine? Why didn't we have that you know, for refugees coming from other um, countries? Uh, why some states in Eastern Europe, you know, behave differently when it comes to Ukrainian refugees compared, you know, to the refugee crisis, you know, we had in 2015, 2016. Uh, <clears throat> these, are, these are valid questions. These are questions of policy. These are questions of, of, of morality, and I'm, and I'm not going to respond to that. Definitely, you know, we see an over hyperactivity. That's what I, I wanted to say, hyperaction on behalf of many institutions, of many um, kind of regional, at least the European Union organization, although Jan presented a different picture from other international organizations. Uh, and this is something that remains to be seen. We are going to see, we are talking about the biggest refugee crisis within the uh, ground of Europe since 1945. I think we have at least 3 million people outside Ukraine, not to talk about, not to mention the internally displaced people who have many, many orphans, uh, the humanitarian suffering, as all of you, uh, team Devika mentioned, is unthinkable. Um, and we still were here and talk about law, which is a bit um, um, surreal, but uh, we are international lawyers and we try uh, to think of law as a power, as a force of good, apart from being a, a power that a, a force, a tool that accommodates power, it can be also a tool that can, that can accommodate something good 
And uh, having said that, you know, I would like to 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 finish by uh, by asking a question, you know, to all the speakers. And this is something that Yuval uh, touched upon. And I have to say that when I started uh, talking about international teaching, international law, these last uh, weeks, I, I found myself in a very difficult, challenging position, uh, trying to convey a message that international law matters. We yes, there are double standards. There was a, always a question of what aboutism. Uh, why in 1999, why in 2003, why didn't we have that reaction? Uh, Veronica talked about this, if I can say, the gravity of violations. And um, that goes back you know, to this understanding that every time we have a violation of a rule, we pay the price. And the so-called West is paying the price. Uh, now, you know, what happened in Iraq, um, of known so forceful reaction, at least in Crimea in 2014, but even before, I think it's very important to understand the events of today uh, with, a, with a kind of historical perspective of already 2014. But I was wondering also, you know, I don't want to leave to finish this meeting with this kind of despair. I, I don't like despair, but I, I was wondering, you know, whether each of them remaining uh, four speakers would like to, to, to say a final word, you know, how do they understand, how do they feel uh, about, uh, uh, about the position, the place of international law and what international law can do actually in a situation like that. So thank you if you would like to. Maybe, yes, Jan? Oh dear, uh, that is the $64,000 question, I guess. Um, I think this confirms, but that's something that, that I think both Tim and Yuval already alluded to earlier. It confirms that, that law generally, international law is no exception, which is more visible perhaps, but law generally is not good in times of crisis. I think law is extremely good in handling our everyday affairs and facilitating the way we run our lives if there is a certain background condition of more or less stable situation. But when the chips are down, law is not good. That's not just in international law that, that international law has that problem with crisis. You also have that in domestic law. If I go shoplifting uh, in my local supermarket and I'm on my own, then I might get caught and I would have a problem. If I take 300 people with me and we go shoplifting together in that same supermarket, then the supermarket has a problem because it can never ever control our, our, all of us together. That, that's a silly example, but you, you get the point perhaps that law is at its very best uh, when it can facilitate, arrange, organize, regulate our everyday lives. And there's plenty of stuff to do there. But when it comes to, to a crisis, when someone is really keen on uh, undermining the everyday, then the law will have a hard time answering. It can answer later, perhaps. It can enter the picture later, perhaps, when, it, when the dust has settled. It can figure out who was right, who was wrong, who should be punished, who should not be punished. But at the moment itself, at the moment itself, it's uh, bound to be a little bit uh, frustrating. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Veronica? Yes, uh, if I may go on. I'm obviously very sad about the situation that we have in, in the region, but I'm at the same time very positive about the lesson learned for international law, because in my opinion, this whole situation confirms that international law matters. If it did not matter, why would so many people be abhorred when one country attacks another country in a clear violation of legal rules. If we look prior to 1945, prior, or prior to the 1920s when the, the prohibition of the aggressive war was introduced, this happened so many, many times. And no one really cares. So there was, that, was, that was maybe stated, that was maybe regretted by some people, but there was no, no common reaction, no mobilization of people. Nowadays we have the, the biggest mobilization of people we've ever seen, at least in, in many countries. We have the, the, the most extensive sanctions probably ever uh, imposed. So this, in my opinion, shows that people do care about, about international law, or at least about some of the fundamental rules on which this law is, is based. And at the same time, I would say international law is also important because it provides us with 
uh, I, I don't want to say certain tools, but probably certain issues which are very important in the current situation. The first one, and that goes back to, to my previous comment, is the, the common language and the common standards we can use to criticize these actions. We did not have these, uh, these common words and common standards in the past, and we would not have them without international law. So that, that's very important, and we should not forget that. The other one are really legal tools, because while international law is not a miraculous uh, system that would solve all the problems of the world in a minute, and that would kind of redress all the violations uh, instantly, it provides us with certain tools. Not all these tools are used at the moment. I already mentioned collective self-defense against Russia, but many of them indeed are sanctions, collective countermeasures, and, and some of the other tools. Uh, they don't work miraculously, but they seem to work to some extent. And again, without international law, you would not have them. Thank you, Veronica. Tim? <laughs> Thanks, Maria. Um... You, you've spoken a couple of times about the exotic location I happen to live in and and part of my sort of sense of this is a little bit of guilt actually that we're, we're sort of geographically isolated and therefore don't feel threatened and I know that many of my friends and colleagues in Europe and particularly in Eastern Europe don't don't feel like that and of course the people of Ukraine it's horrendous for them Sometimes I wonder if we're really deluding ourselves that law might offer some constraints in the context of war, and especially in the face of repeated um, and egregious violations of it. Uh, and I, I guess I, the bottom line for me is that, well, is that a reason to to give up? I mean, it, it, what's the alternative? No. No, in, in I'm, I'm talking specifically about international humanitarian law. What's the alternative? No constraints at all. So no holds barred. Whatever you want to do is fine. So I, I, I do agree with some of what Veronica is saying, that in this current situation, there's a great deal of focus on the violations. And there might many of those might be politically motivated. We know that we, we're not seeing consistency in principled positions in relation to other conflicts. But, um, but I'm heartened to some extent by the uh, commitment and the resolve to try to preserve evidence and gather it and hopefully use it to bring some individuals to account as, a, as, as one limited way. Doesn't, it doesn't constitute restitution for the people of Ukraine who suffered all they have, but one limited way that the international community can um, reinforce its commitment to this particular body of law. Thank you, team. And Devika? I'll be very brief because I know we're at time. Uh, but you, I think despair, Maria, is probably the right place to end. But let me try and be a bit more upbeat because I think the thing about despair, about international law, is that can, it can have this paradoxically invigorating function in the development of law in the sense that we don't know the value of our legal principles unless we subject them to this vigorous debate and contestation. And so I just think of the example, I was in New York for the 2017 ICC Assembly of States parties where they were debating giving the ICC jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. And it was very clear the UK and France were seeking to obstruct the ICC getting jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. Now we have a situation where within the UK, we've got certain, well, Gordon Brown, a former prime minister, leading the charge to set up a special tribunal on aggression. And Tim has mentioned the invigoration of this notion that we need uh, potentially access to this crime of aggression, where that, that is the supreme crime here, again, as Tim has said. There are war crimes, of course there are, but the bigger crime is this actual aggression. Thanks very much. Thank you all. Um, thank you all very much. Um, and I think they muted me already. Can you hear me? <laughs> I can hear you. Ah, you can hear me, okay. I thought I was muted already because we- Ah, you're fine, Maria. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you all very much. I, I wish we had more time about these discussions. You know, I really think that was a, an, a genuinely reflective session. You know, we try to understand all of us, you know, with critical uh, input, what are those activities mean? And, uh, 
And I want to leave the audience. I want to, to thank all of you for participating. And I want to thank all the people, you know, who attended this session and to leave on that note, you know, not a, not a, a pure note of despair, but, you know, things happen, you know, and maybe not immediately, you know, but there is there is something, there is a positive force over there. You know, I don't I want to always to try to convey a message of critique, critique to be critical to my students, but not cynical. And I think this is what we try to do uh, today very much. And I, want, I would like to thank you for being with me on that very short note. You know, yeah, thank you all. Very much. Thank you all thanks very for, much. Yeah. Thank you for participating yeah. and look right. forward to seeing you in person. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you all bye. very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.